Good morning. Well, you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Job, chapter 37. The book of Job, chapter 37. Certainly great seeing each of you here today. We have several visitors and we want you to know that you are our honored guests and we are are thrilled that you are here with us. And we have several of our members that have been away for a while and they're back and whether that was traveling and and even a couple that have been in the hospital recently and, and it's certainly great to see each of you this morning. Well, we tried to get some snow down here in South Louisiana, but it didn't necessarily work out as well as it did in other parts of our state. Uh, This is a picture of Danny Cozenaire Jr.'s family, uh, his three boys, Danny and Raina's children up in Winfield, Louisiana. And as you can tell in the the background, this is, uh, I suppose, three and a half hours north of us. There's snow all over the place, and, and, and they enjoy that for a night and even into the next morning and and that was a wonderful thing for them not us over in Baton Rouge I know some of you are Baton Rouge uh, folks uh, they didn't have as much snow but there was I think even Tiger Stadium was was filled with snow and even on this uh, this car here there was at least ice for a little while that that lasted and and that was I suppose long enough to to write snow at Cajun style uh, in Baton Rouge and then in the New Orleans area uh, this is our snow I think this picture was taken actually in Luling uh, early Friday afternoon and as you can tell it's uh, not snowing but school was released for snow it's 30 degrees not raining and not hardly even any ice on the ground, but school was let out, and I know my kids got home by one o'clock, and and at least we had a, a good time that day. But this movie that is catching everyone's attention, having to do with cold weather, and even ours, even our cold weather is getting our attention to this Disney movie called Frozen. Now, one of the cool things about this particular movie, I've seen it twice is that of all the Disney movies, this one most likely has the most Christian overtones to it. It's certainly not a directly Christian film, but it's the story of two sisters, Elsa and Anna. And Elsa is the older sister who, after her par- their parents decease, Elsa becomes queen, and her little sister is also doing uh, some things. But as children, Elsa was given this magical power to, to turn things into ice and, and to make things frozen. Well, this, the story goes on and, and everything works out all right. And, and Elsa, the little sister, I'm sorry, Anna, the little sister, is able to, to show, in a sense, Christian love and, and allow good to always overcome evil and, and to always give folks a, a second and third and fourth chance and, and helping them to do some things that... All right, so earlier this week at my daughter's school, at Sunshine School, uh, out there in Luling, uh, the director there asked the three-year-old class, so, so who is responsible for the snow? As they were anticipating and hoping to get snow later in the week. And one girl in Brianna's class immediately raised her hand and said, Elsa, Elsa is the one who is responsible for snow. Now we know that's far from the truth as Job 37 verse number 10 says, By the breath of God, ice is given and the broad waters are frozen. Also in Job chapter 38, verse number 10, uh, ver- verse 30, the Bible says, The waters are hardened like stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. This morning, I'd like for us to spend some time in Job chapters 37 and 38, learning more about this God who is able to make things frozen with ice. This God who is able to bring the snow to this world. 
As you know, Job was a fellow during Old Testament times that had a lot of things going for him, at least at one point in his life. But then, for one reason or another, he many, many things were taken from him. And most of the time, when we study the life of Job, we are often asking the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And although that is a worthy question to explore, our focus this morning in Job 37 and 38 is not necessarily to answer that question. Rather, we are desiring this morning to learn more about this God, this God who does incomprehensible things such as making it snow. As you also know, Job had some friends, and, and three in particular, and, and they, not all, they, they did not always give him good advice. In fact, the Lord's uh, had some very harsh words for a lot of what Job's friends had to say. But in Job 37, one of his friends, Elihu, is actually saying some rather accurate things about God. And with all of that said, that brings us to Job 37, beginning in verse number 1. At this, also my heart trembles and leaps from its place. Hear attentively the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He sends it forth under the whole heaven, his lightning to the ends of the earth. After it a voice roars, he thunders with his majestic voice, and he does not restrain them when his voice is heard. God thunders marvelous, marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. Our lesson this morning is entitled, Great Things We Cannot Comprehend. You, all of us realize, and I, hopefully we do anyway, that our God is a great God that does incredible things. Our God is a God who does great things. Sometimes these great things will make perfect sense to us. And when these great things of God make perfect sense to us, we're more likely to worship Him and, and, and praise Him and, and to be at church and, and to go around it and in one form or fashion telling others that God is not only good, but God is great. But other times in life, we know quite honestly and, and quite often that we also have experienced things in this life that make absolutely no sense to us at all. And there's a temptation, I suppose, that when things do not make perfect sense to us, we're, we're tempted to stop worshiping God. We're tempted to, to no longer come to church and we often are asking questions such as, why do bad things happen to good people? If God is so good, why are these things happening that make absolutely no sense at all? But as we are exploring this text in Job 37 and 38 this morning, here is the main point, and this is the main point up front, in that just because... We do not fully understand what is happening in our lives. It does not mean that God stops being good. Let me say it in another way and maybe even a more simplified manner. Our God is always great, even when it does not make perfect sense to us. That's the big point of the lesson. Our God is always great, even when life does not make perfect sense to us. As we're considering how awesome our God is, we're noticing first of all this morning that He is a God that is filled with wondrous 
works. Notice with me a few of the verses in this section of Job 37, beginning in verse number 6. For the Lord says to the snow, be on the earth. Likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He seals the hand of every man that all men may know his work. Verse number 10, by the breath of God, ice is given and the broad waters are frozen. Verse number 14, listen to this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of his cloud to shine? Do you know the balance of clouds? Those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge. Our God is a God that is filled with wondrous works. And although these wondrous works do not always make perfect and complete sense to us, as we see here at the end of verse 16, our God is perfect in knowledge. He is complete in knowledge. Now, sometimes we run into folks in this life in this life that feel like they know everything and they want us to know how much they know. But we often realize very quickly that, that there is no one who has complete and perfect knowledge except for our God. You see, because of the wondrous works of God and, and his perfection of knowledge, his completion of knowledge, we understand that even though something may not make sense to us, it always makes sense to God. And as we respond in faith and obedience, we understand that God is doing great things and he is filled with wondrous works. Secondly, this morning, as we're considering some great things about God that we do not always comprehend, not only is he a God filled with wondrous works, he is also a God of almighty awesomeness. Now, yes, that is a word. I, I did look it up just to make sure. But our God is almighty, and our God is Awesome. Notice verses 22 through 24 of Job 37. He comes from the north as golden splendor. With God is awesome majesty. As for the Almighty, we cannot find him. He is excellent in power, in judgment. And abundant justice. He does not oppress. Therefore men fear him. He shows no partiality to any who are wise of heart. In this passage we learn about the almighty awesomeness of God. Including his splendor. His majesty. His power, His justice, and His non-partiality to all of those who are wise of heart. You may recall last Sunday morning we, we looked at the idea of all of us are one in Christ. For there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, etc., etc. For we are all one in Christ Jesus, our almighty God, who is filled with this awesomeness, understands that everyone has the opportunity to be a part of his family. And everyone has the opportunity to praise and to magnify this great God of heaven. We've never seen him, as the text says, but we respond to him in faith. And we have a fear of God, not that we're afraid of him in that regard, as little children are to many things. But we have a respectful fear to God, understanding that he is our creator 
And one day he will be our judge. And so we respond to his grace and mercy and love through praising him and by worshiping him, recognizing how awesome of a God he is. One current day songwriter says it this way, The splendor of a king clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. There are some great things about God that we cannot fully comprehend. And some of these are His wondrous works, even though we get a glimpse of them in our lives. And also His almighty awesomeness. We get a glimpse of these items in our lives as well. In a third aspect of who God is and what He does is a reflection of His eternal existence. Notice with me now in the book of Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7. And these are no longer the words of Job's friend Elihu. But now these are the words of God. And our God is reminding Job who exactly is eternal and who exactly is not. Job is learning from this account that God is God and he is not. Picking up in verse 4 of Job 38, the word of the Lord says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined the measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundation fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The rest of chapter 38 goes on, and I encourage you to read it later, to talk about how awesome of a creation that God was able to establish, including the clouds and the sun, including the snow and all other aspects of weather, and and then stars and all kinds of, of awesome things. And we realize, as we take a look at this text, that we are the ones that were created But it is our God who is eternal. And and there may be some of us this morning that are struggling with understanding the reality of God's existence. I suppose all of us from time to time have doubts and ask the question, "Is is God real? Where did all of this come from? But for me, whenever I'm having those moments of doubt, I always go back to the idea of creation. And I ask the question, where did all of this come from? Now our non-Christian friends would say it was all an evolutionary process that started from one tiny little cell. But my question to them is where did that cell come from? You see, all of God's, or all of anything that is designed must have a designer. And anything that is of material substance had to have started somewhere, somehow. And so the answer is not to continue looking for other aspects of this life, but to understand that there is something, rather there is someone much bigger and better than this world. And it is our God, our awesome God, who was around before the creation of the world, before the foundations of this earth were formed. Our God is eternal. And if our God was around prior to this creation, before this life began, our God is going to be around after this creation and when this world comes to an end. And all of us have an eternal sense to us because we have souls And although we will not always live in this life forever, 
We will live forever somewhere because of God's eternal existence and the way that He has created us and the way that He is desiring to save us. As we begin to seek application for the text and as we begin to close, the two main points of of application there uh, for you are, are on the screen before you. Let's go over to the New Testament quickly as we wrap things up this morning. First over to the book of Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. As we try to bring all of these things together, we realize that there are some great things that we cannot fully understand or comprehend about God. However, just because we cannot fully comprehend Him at all times and in every situation does not mean that we cannot comprehend Him at all. You see, our God has revealed Himself several times throughout history. He revealed Himself in the sense of this creation, uh, of this physical world around us. He revealed Himself through the, the, during the Old Testament days, and including during the days of the prophets and, and others. He ultimately revealed Himself through His Son, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God, with us. But as we come to Luke chapter 24, we understand that our God has also revealed himself through the inspired word of God. In Luke chapter 24, verse number 44, these are the words of Christ. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And notice verse 45, And Jesus opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Yes, there are great things about God that we will never fully comprehend, but our God has given us His Word that is inspired by the Holy Spirit, which gives us an opportunity to comprehend some of who God is. Comprehend to a a point where these scriptures teach us everything that we need to know about how to live in this world. And it teaches us everything we need to know in order to become a Christian and to accept God's plan of salvation in our lives. And the second point of application is can be found over in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 3. Beginning in verse number 14. The Bible says, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirits in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, and notice verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints... What is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God? Ultimately, this text is pointing us to the incredible sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and His love that stretches in every direction, north, south, east, and west. But notice again in verse number 18, in the beautiful plan of God, that we are not in this all alone. As we are striving to comprehend the Scriptures to learn about God, We're we're called in Ephesians 3 verse 18 to comprehend with all the saints. 
Do you, do you get the idea there? It's the idea that we're not in this alone. Rather, we have each other. We have our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and so when life doesn't make perfect sense to us, when, when we feel like there are bad things happening to us as we are striving to live good lives, it's the understanding that we're not going to fully comprehend everything about God at all times. But as we study His Word, and as we spend time with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to get through those difficult times. But you see, so many times when things are go rough or things are go tough, people stop reading the Bible and people stop coming to church. But when life gets tough, we can further understand how God is working in our lives by studying Scripture and being together with all the saints as we are striving to understand how awesome our God is and how much He loves us and how much He desires for us to be with Him in heaven for all of eternity. This morning we are singing this song of encouragement. And if you would like to become a Christian this morning, you could never find a better time. And it's one of those things where all you need to do is to respond to God's plan of salvation. He loves you. He sent Jesus to die for you and to be raised on that third day. And so we respond in faith. We respond in repentance of sins, confession of our faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we respond by being baptized into Christ, immersed into water to have all of our sins forgiven. That's how we are a part of God's family. And that's what gives us hope as we respond to His grace and His mercy. If you need to come forward this morning, will you do so while together we stand and sing?